the lunch chat, diversity in commercial space, how to start our off right in New York City, being moderated by the fabulous Carlene Han, who does partnerships and growth for Gus. Hi. So Gus is actually the partner that launched Digital.NYC a year and a half ago. It's New York City's official hub for everything tech and startup. So I actually work with Minerva and Sandy here on stage. And I'll introduce everyone now. We have Shobana. She is a science and technology policy fellow at NASA, where she focuses on health and air quality issues. Next, we have Sandy Carter. She is the chief evangelist at IBM, where she focuses on the cloud solutions. We have Minerva Tantoko, who is New York City's first ever CTO. She's in charge of um, Hello. bringing initiatives across the city agencies and incorporating startups and technology into New York City. And then we have Jennifer. You might recognize her. She's just on stage. <laughs> She's a technology lead at Thesis for the Advancement of Science. So our, our panel today is actually going to focus on um, diversity around STEM. I think all of us here, we all have a really interesting viewpoint. We have civic tech. Um, we have a big technology company space. So a couple of different angles to talk about those diversity issues. Everyone has a different definition of diversity. Can you tell me about what that word means to you and if it's relevant, how your organization <laughs> tackles diversity? Hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me? OK, great. Um, uh, just wanted to say thank you for inviting me to speak at this panel. And um, yeah, when I first hear the word diversity, you know, being an Indian woman, I automatically think demographics, like, OK, gender and um, background. But the more I thought about the diversity in tech um, topic, I actually started thinking about diversity in background. So my background is I'm a physician scientist. I have no tech background at all. Mm. So working, in, um, working at NASA and um, being here at this hackathon, it's actually a very uh, different environment for me. So that's kind of what I wanted to focus on. And um, the program that I work in is Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences Program in the Art Science Division at NASA. And I feel that NASA does a lot of things to include various different backgrounds in terms of um, fields of study and the kinds of things people are doing to see if um, space data can be useful in any way. And um, my program is a part of that. We take earth science data, remote sense data, and see how we can use it in different fields, for example. Not just weather forecasting, but we try to use earth science data for health and air quality monitoring. And we work with several other, other federal agencies like the EPA, CDC, and uh, see how our data can be useful for these other agencies as well. So we have a lot of outreach and a lot of educational opportunities, including some capacity building programs that try to include diverse fields of study and, and practice. And, um, and that's, that's basically one of the things that our organization does to build diversity within the, the space community. Um, well, hi, I'm Minerva Tantoko. I, I'm sure you can hear me. <laughs> if you're having a conversation that's not part of this, go away. Um, yeah. You know, so, yeah, that's why they made me CTO. I'm just sort of put, say what's on my mind. Um, so, for us, I think especially in New York City government, diversity is really the secret sauce for New York City. We have the diversity of industry here. We've got every other industry, including tech and space, but we also have financial services, health, bio, and all of those have hyphen techs next to them. We've got fashion tech. The other day I saw something that was shoe tech. Um, uh, actually, it was, a, it was a, a basketball player, Melo Anthony, is investing in shoe tech because, of course, he would, right? Um, that makes total sense. And he's doing that in New York City. So, you know, there's all kinds of diversity here. Of course, I think about people of color. Of course, I think about women. Being a woman entrepreneur, I started my first company in 1985 in Silicon Valley. 
I was not only one of the few women, but one of the few uh, non-whites there starting companies um, in Silicon Valley in 1985. And so for me, this is also a personal passion as well. We now know that you know, women run companies do better. We know that diverse companies do better. So there's actually a direct correlation between diversity at the senior most levels and throughout a company's um, uh, ranks and success. Because really, technology and uh, science are about people. And you have to have the people making the tech that look like the people that are using the tech. So some of the things we're doing in New York, we have our, the Women Entrepreneurs Program. It's called We uh, uh, NYC. It's part of our small business services. The Economic Development Corporation is huge in developing a diversity of location. So building up tech sectors in other boroughs. Um, and you know, I'm really proud to say that you know we're just starting this this journey. But you know, New York City is the highest number of women-founded tech companies in the country by percent, 21 percent. Yeah. And we know that women entrepreneurs are the engine of growth. And so, um, you know, diversity means to me success. That's great. I would have to agree with that as well. I think uh, just listening to um, uh, some of the personal aspects of diversity, and I, I, that also resonates with, with my background, starting in science and tech. Um, and, and I think that diversity is, is also what is a, a, sort of the, the, the beauty of innovation. Um, you know, when you have people coming from different backgrounds, uh, you know, di diverse uh, backgrounds and, and sort of having this blending of, of uh, different industries, um, you know, that at least from, from where I sit and what, what we do with the International Space Station, uh, it's incredible to see all of these uh, different groups coming together uh, to really champion um, innovation and champion um, discovery, exploration, uh, new concepts. So, um, you know, I think also f from a personal standpoint, um, that, that really resonates with me uh, growing up in science and tech, always being the minority uh, female in, in these uh, mostly dominated or male dominated environments um, and, f and just figuring out how to make it work for you and figuring out how to, to get through that. Um, and I think we are seeing you know, a lot more of that diversity, especially nowadays. I was just going to also mention really quick to plug in um, the uh, last year with the NASA Space Apps Challenge, we, we had an incredible gathering with our NASA Datanaut Corps, which was a, a founding group um, at uh, uh, NASA's Open Innovation and Technology team, and it was a founding, it was the first um, uh, founding class of all women at NASA, which is uh, absolutely incredible. Um, and we did talk about these things in terms of diversity and, 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 what, and what does that mean, how, how are we f using that as fuel uh, for innovation and, and, and technology advancement, et cetera. So, I just wanted to add that piece as well. I think that's very important. Um, Minerva, you, hello? Hello? What? Yeah. Hello? Um, so Minerva, you already mentioned it. So yep, New York City leads the country for most female founders. It's actually, Brooklyn actually has the highest percentage. It's 28% of companies started in Brooklyn have a female founder, 21% in Manhattan. And that leads the country, um, Silicon Valley and San Francisco are about 14% and 18%. So these are very statistically significant numbers. What do you think it is about New York City that breeds this um, environment or makes it so friendly for female entrepreneurs? Well, I, hi. Um, apart from just New York being the most awesome place on the planet, um, actually, you know, New York City is, is a city built on diversity, and it's built on sort of that whole melting pot concept and accepting and, and, and not really caring where the good ideas come from and promoting that. But I think also, you know, we are, we are actually very intentionally looking to build a woman-friendly, diversity-friendly tech sector here. That it's like, you can't just sort of naturally hope it happens. Um, and if you look at some of the other tech sectors in the country, you know, women are having more trouble getting 
funding, you know, women are, you know, uh, minorities are not getting startups uh, funding from VCs. And so we're, we're putting out the welcome mat and saying, bring your great ideas here. That's beginning to work. I think one of the things that people don't um, realize a lot is that if you turn up at a place and you're the only person of your kind, whatever that is, you get this kind of ambient feeling of unwelcomeness. You feel uncomfortable, slightly uncomfortable. And, you know, you have to actually very intentionally combat that feeling by saying, no, actually, we need you. We want you here. You know, I, I, I'm fond of saying that for 30 years I was a, a female tech executive. Um, and, you know, it was quite often the only woman in the room. I like to say I, it was like I had a private bathroom on <laughs> everywhere I worked. Um, <laughs> So I was the only one using the ladies' room in many cases. Uh, you know, sometimes people are, you're the only woman on this floor. You're the only woman in this building. You know, and, and that is really tough. And so you have to sort of reach out and make it a point of saying, we welcome you. We want your ideas. We're going to have programs specifically to support you. Um, and that goes all the way to young uh, girls and women learning how to code and learning about science and having the right role models. I was lucky. I had engineers and doctors, women in my family. Um, and so it was never a question to me to, to enter science and to enter um, technology. But for so many other folks, they need to see the visible role models and understand that this is a place where we want you to come. This is where you're, you, we are building a tech ecosystem for everyone and for all New Yorkers. I would also say that um, New York has diversity of types of startups that other places don't have. So you heard about you know, food startups and fashion startups and digital startups. If you go to Silicon Valley in San Francisco, most of the startups there are very hardcore tech. They're more horizontal, less vertical, and they also don't have the support. But I also think a lot of it has to do with the the blending and the supporting of some of these other areas. Um, if you look today across the world, women-owned startups are 15% more profitable, but they're 40% less likely to be funded, 40%. So I think here, um, women founders and funders have found a nice home because of first the verticalization, but also I think the support elements that you mentioned as well. So I'm not from New York, but I love visiting here. Um, and yesterday when I got off my train, I was walking to my hotel, and um, there's this graffiti on the wall that says, you go, girl. And it was so <laughs> awesome. To, <laughs> I'm like, I posted a picture on my Instagram, but I'm going to put it on Twitter. And you know, But it was just like, oh, well, that's nice. You know, it goes with the theme for today. But um, I, I do feel that one of the things that New York has is the people are, I, I think people are extremely nice here. And, the other thing is um, there's a very you do, you do you kind of attitude, which is really in a way supportive and kind of builds your confidence because people don't really you know, stop and say, why'd you do that? And I, I really admire that in, in the city. So that's my visitor perspective. So <laughs> Yeah, you can move here anytime. I just wanted to add one last plug. Uh-oh. I just wanted to add one last plug for actually, um, it's a little known fact, so I like to talk about it whenever I can. You know, under Mayor de Blasio, 58% um, 58% of his senior leadership in the de Blasio administration are female. That was, again, very, in yes, yeah. very intentional. New York is run by women. That's what, you know, that's what I wanted to say. So please come and join us. And, and actually, on the sort of broader tech team, um, our, our tech team is comprised of, you know, all, uh, we have Dr. Amin Ram Arshariki, he's our ma mayor's office of data analytics. We have our commissioner of the Department of IT, Ann Roast, another, uh, another great tech woman. Um, we have our chief digital officer, Jesse Singleton. 
And um, Maya Wiley, who's in charge of our equity and broadband initiative, she's a counsel to the mayor and on tech policy. So we've got a, an amazing, just on tech alone, you know, female dominated, uh, you know, diverse team. And I would say it's not just, you know, um, women funders and founders here in New York, girls who code was founded right here in New York as well. Reshma, not here today, but an amazing woman that's had an impact, not just here in New York City, but around the world with what she's doing. So, you know, starting young and growing them up. So I grew up, I grew up in a family of engineers, but I think role models, the people that we see in media, on TV, people portraying these typical genders plays a really important role in your concepts and your understanding of what you think something should look like. I remember when I was eight years old in class, one of our assignments was draw a picture of a scientist. I got, a, I got an F on that. I, I've never gotten anything below an A minus, so I was just shocked. I had drawn a picture of a white male wearing a lab coat. And I went up to the teacher, really upset. I don't understand, this is what every single scientist I've ever seen on TV looks like. Every time I read about it in a book, why is this wrong? And she looked at me, like, this doesn't look like you. Like, why, why didn't you draw a picture of yourself? Explain yourself. Like, why did you think that you couldn't be a scientist? Why can't this be someone who's female? So I'm curious to see if, um, obviously, Minerva, you had a whole family of engineers but everyone else, was there a particular mentor or a role model that you looked up to? I mean, you guys all hold really prominent roles in STEM, so pretty awesome. We all ended up here. I'm just seeing, was there someone that was kind of your cheerleader or was it kind of more of like you against everyone else in the room this whole time? Well, there's some interesting data um, about the importance of dads in a young girl's future in STEM, and I thought this was really interesting. So if you're a dad out there, we call them affectionately DODs, dads of daughters. Very, very important. So if a dad plays an active role in encouraging his daughter, those daughters are twice as likely to graduate from high school, but they score five times higher on STEM even if the dad is not in STEM because the dad has encouraged his daughter. And so for us, like at IBM, we have a, a diversity group. I run the largest and longest running diversity group at IBM with thousands of women. And one of the things we did right away to get that group to grow and to have encouragement is we went out and recruited dads of daughters within IBM. First of all, they're passionate about it. It's personal, any movement that you have can't just be words, it's gotta be passion, it's gotta be from within. And we found that those dads with daughters care more because they don't want their daughters to earn half of what a guy does. They don't want their daughters not to get funded just because they're a woman or a girl. So they have a personal interest and responsibility in this. And just as chance would have it, my dad, although not in STEM, encouraged me and said that I could do absolutely anything I wanted to do, whether that was to be a fashion model, a newscaster, a doctor, or a computer scientist. And I still remember when I had um, gotten accepted into one of the higher AP classes in math, and the teacher, who was a man, came up to me and said, you don't really want to do that. You probably want to go do something else. This was the math teacher telling me I shouldn't do it because I was a girl. I still remember the day that my dad, I told him, he marched right into that school, talked to that teacher, and I can guarantee you that teacher never said that to another girl uh, ever. And so I think that you know one of the things that we should embrace, and in fact, if you're a dad with a daughter here, you should understand the importance of the role that you play in more girls, more your daughter in STEM. Companies are, companies are really quick to blame the lack, of, um, the lack of talent coming in as a reason why their entire workforce is very lowly proportional minorities or females. Um, clearly, in the city government, we see that more than 58% of leadership, they're all females, they're all really awesome role models. So this pipeline problem, I see a problem with this. What do you think, um, how do you think we should solve this? You know, if like, hey, we're just not getting those quality applicants coming in. Like, 
What would you say to these HR departments, these companies that are using this as an excuse? So, uh, you know, the, I think the pipeline complaint is a little bit of a red herring, you know, um, because sometimes I talk to companies and, and say, do you want, you know, to bring on some interns? And they go, well, we only hire out of the Ivy Leagues. So that's not a pipeline problem. You know, you're looking uh, in too narrow of a space for the kind of employees that, that you're looking for. And, you know, I agree. The number one thing that tech companies need, that, that STEM, you know, businesses need is talent. So we, we've started to uh, focus on that uh, in, in the last year and a half or so. You know, New York City's tech talent pipeline is a direct partnership with industry and um, uh, institu uh, in educational institutions to, to train adults and put them directly into jobs. It's called the tech talent pipeline for a reason. And I think one of the reasons that it's so successful is that it finds people with the aptitude to become UX designers, to become web developers that you wouldn't ordinarily look. And the companies that we partner with um, are very grateful because they are getting the talent they need. They're getting the web developers and mobile developers they need. They just weren't looking in the right places. We just announced last fall Computer Science for All. This is a 10-year, $80 million program to, to allow access to computer education for every New York City public school kid because we're very focused on assuring that the talent that's right here in New York City gets the chance to study. So there's a kind of inequity in opportunity and there's an inequity in, in education that also will, you know, contributes to the so-called pipeline problem. And so we're, we're addressing those two things very, very directly in that way. And, you know, it's, it's not just about fairness. It is an economic imperative. The U.S. Department of Labor says that there will be 1.4 million tech jobs by the year 2020. It's not that far away. And our educational pipeline is projected to only fill 29% of those jobs. So we really uh, need to do something. We need to do it now if we're going to continue to compete in the global and digital economy. Yeah. Oh. I just wanted to add to that. Um, you know, I think I, I absolutely agree uh, with everything Minerva said. Um, one of the things I think is also lacking is um, outreach into different communities. We have we have a lot of opportunities and a lot of you know training um, material and resources. Unfortunately, don't those don't always make it down to people like everybody in the community. And I think that's something that. Um, a lot of federal agencies are also addressing, I know a, a National Science Foundation, um, NIH, NASA, we all have educational components in our mission. And one of those is to reach out to communities that don't normally see what we do and tell them. You know, I, I, it's hard to imagine people to get interested about space if they don't know about it. So, so that's sort of a goal um, of the groups is to you know, go out there and, and tell people about it. Um, the program that sponsors or that organizes my uh, fellowship is uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, if, you'll all, if you're familiar with Science Magazine, they're the group that publishes that. Mm. And they have a lot of um, educational opportunities as well. And uh, they actually have a fellowship for science communication and media. So, you know, how do we have innovation in how we communicate about science and the opportunities and, and training resources that are out there? So. I was just going to add as well to underline what Minerva was saying as far as the red herring piece. I, I agree with that. I think we're, we're starting to see that I mean, it's changing. Obviously, it's still a long road. Um, but I think the other piece, uh, also what she was mentioning in terms of the educational side, that uh, you know when uh, she was talking about computer science for all, um, and we're seeing that on, on the, the national level uh, with the White House uh, announcing this with code or hour of code, code.org. Um, and, and so I think it's, it's sort of this you know full ecosystem of, you know, it needs to happen at the, at the, the local level with schools. Uh, once we start to get those, um, uh, those particular subjects integrated and more uh, institutionalized, uh, that that's obviously going to be helping with, with this sort of pipeline or the, the so-called pipeline problem, which um, I think it's definitely, I think that's, uh, that's, that's sh there's definitely a shift there. So, um, you know, personally, you know, from growing up 
in, and to date myself in the 80s, you know, I was exposed to computer science. I, I actually just gave a talk recently and I had this photo of, um, of the old Mac or Apple uh, computer with Oregon Trail on it and, you know, I was playing some of those games <laughs> back in the 80s and, I mean, I still remember that. You know, you're learning problem solving, you're learning computer science, you're, you're learning so many different things and, and that stays with you and, and you, you start to apply those things as you, you get older and, and so I was just going to mention that I think um, it's, it starts, you know, I think it starts early and, and we're seeing that um, with some of these incredible uh, programs or like computer science for all that's definitely moving in, in the right direction. So. And I'm not sure there is as big of a pipeline issue as everyone believes. I do think we'll have some, but I also think that a lot of times it's a stereotype we have in our head about who would fit this role. So if you think about the last 20 unicorns, how many of those CEOs do you guys think were tech CEOs? All of them? Most of them? Very few. Very few of the tech companies, unicorns, were, were CEOs that were technical. So I think a lot of times when people go out there and they look for someone, they're like, oh, this is a tech company. We need a CEO who's technical. When really you might need a business leader or someone who understands tech, which there are a lot of diverse candidates for. So I think a lot of times we pigeonhole roles and we have something in our head and I think all of us need to challenge, did you consider Sally? Did you consider Mary? Did you consider, because a lot of times people just aren't considering because of that stereotype or you know, what Harvard calls that unconscious bias. Twitter, Twitter recently hired a head of diversity and inclusion. Um, it was one of their attempts to tackle um, this diversity issue and they thought that people would applaud them for this. Instead, everyone, Everyone just went really angry on them on Twitter. There were some pretty great tweets about this. Um, and one of the reasons why was they hired a white male who had done diversity at Apple. Um, not well, because a lot of people, when they left Apple, they talked about how they didn't feel included. A lot of minorities left. And one of the responses that stood out to me was someone said, no company should ever have a head of diversity and inclusion. It should be Jack at Twitter, the CEO and founder should be the head of diversity and inclusion. It's his job to champion this mission in a company. Once, if you are the CEO and you want to get something done, you tell the managers below. You, you tell people like, hey, this is something that we need to work on and it gets done. Like, there's no one above you. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Whose job do you think it is to own the diversity, the diversity numbers at a company? Well, I mean, just like you would have a sales leader, because sales are important to your company, I actually think that a diversity leader is a good thing. Um, I think it signals to me that the company cares about it, that the CEO cares about it enough to where he or she is putting resource behind it. Um, that being said, you know, just like you know, many companies have a chief innovation officer, but not all innovation comes from the chief innovation officer. I think that diversity is everyone's job. And to me, having a chief diversity officer doesn't mean that's the only place that diversity comes from. It means it should be embedded throughout, just like you have a chief innovation officer and everybody should innovate. So that's what I think. Um, I, I agree. I think, you know, um, even though you have, it, it takes a little while for things to become integrated into their mainstream operations. And until you know, we see movement, I think having someone in charge and, and just overseeing diversity efforts is not necessarily a bad thing. That's um, my perspective as the CEO is overseeing everything and having someone, you know, and they delegate their tasks to people within their organization, you know, different tasks go to different people. And this should be a priority. This should be something that you have someone you know, overseeing. And I do think it's okay to have a guy as a chief diversity officer. In fact, I think it actually is good. Um, if you look at the numbers over the last you know, 10 years, um, diversity has, you know, women and diverse leaders has not gone up. And so Albert Einstein once said, you know, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is insanity. So just having women supporting a diversity initiative isn't gonna work. You need the support of dads of daughters, of men in a company. It has to be everybody's responsibility. And so 
I wouldn't just be upset because there was a male chief of diversity. I actually think that is a good thing if we can rally the entire population, not just a part of the top population about it. Is that a man doing that back there? No, I'm just, I'm just teasing. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would agree. Uh, you know, what matters more than who's in charge of diversity is the results. And, you know, if we see the needle move, I don't care who's in charge of that. That's a good thing. And, you know, especially for me in the last 10 years in particular, in financial services tech, um, which is, I call the double whammy <laughs> of, you know, um, you know, my mentors and best champions have been very senior executives who are white males. And, um, you know, they make, made a point of making sure that they afforded opportunities for advancement, for, for career, for, um, you know, uh, great assignments, because they, they made it a point to make it their job to do that. So what really matters more is that the diversity numbers change, and we should have diversity in those diversity roles as well. Yeah, I agree. I just had a quick thing to add, add to that. I think, you know, I, I, that it's absolutely right. It, I don't, it doesn't really matter who does it. I think one thing that might be an advantage, though, is if it's someone who's familiar with the challenges of being uh, from, you know, a different demographic. And I can say, for example, as a, you know, yeah, like technically I qualify as a, you know, a minority, you know, I'm a female, and, um, but I've been pretty, pretty lucky my life. You know, I've had really awesome parents, a really good support network. So when, when I'm asked about what were the challenges you faced as a woman, I, I honestly couldn't think of one because I've never looked in the mirror and said, I am a woman scientist. You know, it's like, I, I do what I do and that's who I am. Um, so I think perhaps having the perspectives of people who might have actually encountered those challenges. So when we hire someone for a diversity leadership role, you know, people who genuinely have faced challenges and have addressed those, um, I'm not saying it was a smooth ride all the way, but I can't necessarily, you know, speak to, to uh, huge disadvantages. So I think someone who comes from that background might be, might be important in that position. For so many companies, diversity is just kind of a check the box off kind of thing. You know, they go through their process and they'll say like, hey, we hired, this year we hired 20% more female engineers. I think we're done, we're good. And I think a really good quote about this is, diversity is being asked to the party. Inclusiveness is being asked to dance. Why go through the efforts of putting all these diversity initiatives if you're not gonna go and make people feel included? It's one of the reasons why there's been a really big trend of top female executives leaving companies that they had done such a great job at just because they just felt uncomfortable and it wasn't worth that total shift in tone and the way they were treated. What do you think are some ways that we can, that we should address this? If you are, if a company has put in the effort, like, you know, they're doing really well from that top level perspective of diversity, like, what is the next step? Like, how do we be more inclusive? Here we go. So, um, you know, I think, I think inclusion is a really big deal because if you're not included, then you don't feel like you're part of the team, and then you're not going to be successful in what, they, what you're doing. A lot of times what I see companies that will encourage is that, let's say that you're sitting at a table and you know maybe someone, it doesn't have to be a woman or someone diverse who's not speaking up, that the culture of the company is to say, you know, so uh, Jessica, what do you think? And bring them into the equation to build teams that naturally are diverse. So for instance, we're gonna be running a hackathon in June. And most hackathons today, uh, the teams are primarily men. Well, we're gonna require that the teams, three of five, have to be diverse candidates. Men, women, but diversity. So by doing that, we're putting a stake in the ground that says we want folks to be included. So I think a lot of it has to do with culture, not just a strategy of diversity. Um, one of my favorite quotes is that culture eats strategy for lunch, <laughs> right? 
So you could have this great strategy and you could say, oh, we want 20%, we want this, we want that. But if the culture isn't embracing and you don't do things that really does drive that inclusion, then culture will always win, always win over your strategy. And so I think companies have to look at, and the best companies look at the culture as well as you know, the, the policy, if you would, the strategy. This is a, an audience member wrote this question for you. Can you talk about what IBM is doing to encourage girls to go into tech? And maybe if it's relevant for other people, how your companies and organizations are encouraging girls to go into tech? Yeah, so um, I am really excited about what IBM's doing to encourage girls to go into tech. So we have something called um, Excite Camps. I don't know if anybody has heard of these camps, but they're really amazing. We do them in 138 countries around the world. And what we do is for a week, we bring in um, young girls in, the, in middle school and we ask them first the question, you know, how many of you guys want to do a tech career? And usually the numbers are 5 to 10% max. And then during the week we bring in inspirational leaders who look like them. We let them play with robots that have Watson and AI in it. We let them design their own website or create wearable IoT jewelry. And last year at the end of the Excite Camps was more than 90% of the young girls who said, I want to do something in tech. I didn't realize this was in tech. In fact, I first remember I kicked off one of the sessions and um, one of the girls said, oh, you don't look like somebody in tech. And I'm like, really? What am I supposed to look like? They said, well, you're supposed to have glasses and you're supposed to, your hair's supposed to be all messy and you know, you're not supposed to dress pretty. And that's what they thought. And they also asked me, really interesting, do they lock you in the basement? Because they thought all tech people are in the basement and locked away, right? <laughs> um, so I think you know part of what we're doing is these Excite Camps. We also support girls who code. Um, this year we're going to do another four different camps for girls who code. Yesterday we had uh, Bring Your Daughter to Work Day, and that exposes a lot of the employees' children to what's happening and what's going on. So IBM does you know, hackathons for young girls. We do so many things to encourage that next generation of uh, technologists. I was just going to say something really quick. I'll be super fast um, for, and you could probably add to this in terms of NASA, but uh, specifically with the International Space Station uh, at CASIS, we have a number of education programs. We're really trying to bring uh, a wide variety of students, um, uh, of course, girls, but but you know across. Um, you know, for, for boys as well, across all um, backgrounds and, and, and around the country to try to get them interested in space, get them interested in science and technology, working on uh, computer science programs. We have a bunch of challenges uh, that, we, um, that we execute every year. And, and of course, when we were mentioning the, the, the Data Knots uh, program, I mean, initially that was meant to be, we, we, the founding class was, was all female, but it is an all-inclusive uh, program, and that's something that's going to be um, um, also expanding in, in the coming year, in the next uh, few years. Uh, so hopefully, you know, that will, will um, get more um, of the public excited about data science, computer science, and, and then looking at space as a, as a tool or space as a way to, to explore that. So I just wanted to add that really quick. Yeah, and one of the things I think we also need to do, too, I have uh, two daughters. And one of my daughters uh, had to write a book report, and she wanted to write it on a technologist. And so we went to Barnes and Noble and her choices for women technologists, there were no books there. Um, there were books on Florence Nightingale, not to say that those aren't good books, they are, but there was no tech books on women who had actually a lot of women helped put the first rocket into space and there were none of those books in the store. So one of the things, I'm on the, on the board of Girls in Tech and Women in Tech and one of the things we would like to do is to put out some of these books that are inspirational for uh, young girls. What do you guys think? Do you guys agree? Yes. Yeah? Okay. We have time for one last question. So I think we've done a really good job talking about how we can get more women involved in STEM, um, getting their first step into the door. But what about when they're already at an organization? What can we do to encourage or support getting more women in those leadership roles? We definitely see, I still think that glass ceiling very much still exists, where you just aren't seeing those women at very high positions. Like, What can we do? 
Yeah, I certainly think that, especially what I'd call a mid-career, when you're, you know, trying to decide, should I have a family or do I want a career? Um, you know, certainly when I, I got my very first uh, chief technology officer job, the same uh, CTO at Gray Advertising in 1997, that was the same year I found out I was pregnant. And I was really torn between, like, do I choose one or the other? And again, it was a very encouraging word from a trusted friend uh, who said, well, of course, you can do both, you mm -hmm. know. And I think it's to be there in those moments and say, actually, you know, if you were a man, you wouldn't be asking this question, can I have a kid and be CTO, right? Um, and so, you know, so I think uh, part of it is bringing up that awareness and being there for those folks and saying you can do it uh, and, and, and not make it seem like it's an either or. And then, you know, I have to plug, by the way, you gotta pay women the same. That would be helpful. Um, yes, absolutely. And I would also say, um, a lot of times when women start getting promoted, they get into the bro culture. There's a culture out there that's very male-oriented and male-dominated. And one of the things that, um, that we've started to do recently is to, and I think you might have suggested, to kind of reverse, the, to let someone feel what it's like to be in that situation. So uh, recently we had about 200 women that came in for a conference, and we invited one of the senior leaders uh, at our company, who was a man, to come. And I was supposed to escort him in, because I know him. And so he got there early. So this, and this guy is really loud and boisterous and you know, just very dynamic. So I didn't realize he had come in early. So I was looking for him and someone said, oh, I think I saw him come in. Well, there's this room of 200 women there, this boisterous, loud, wow, executive. And I found him in the corner of the room, <laughs> in the very corner of the room, kind of like looking around. And I went up to him and I said, what's going on? Are you feeling okay? Because I'd never seen him like that before. And he said, oh my God, this feels really awkward. And he said, is this what you feel like? And I said, yeah, sometimes this is what I feel like. And I just have to kind of suck it in and go and say, hey, how was that football game Monday night? <laughs> and I think it was a real eye-opening opener for him to say, wow, so this is what it feels like. And it's not the same bro culture that he was used to, and he's now become one of the champions. So I think some of what we can do is to let people experience it, because again, it's hard if you can't personally touch or feel it, it's hard to make a difference. I just wanted to end on one last note, one thing for you guys to think about. Um, there, was, there was a video game that came out last week, I wish you remembered the name of it, but it made the news because when you go in and you create your, your user avatar, it randomly assigns you a gender and an ethnicity. People got really angry because they couldn't choose exactly who it was that represented them. And the video game company responded and said, actually, this is a situation that affects more than half of the population on a daily basis, where they can't choose someone that reflects them. So we want you to play the video game as is. You're going to be that randomly assigned person. And just want you guys to think about that. And I guess keynote on diversity, panel, panel on diversity. Great. Right. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you for the mics, too. <laughs> <laughs>